Joining us now, live here in Los Angeles, is Kurt Vonnegut. Hello, Kurt. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's something we've all been looking forward to, definitely. I want to mention to people first that for the first time, some short stories that you wrote for various magazines from 1954 through 1961 have been compiled, and they are in a new book that is called Bagambo Snuffbox, Uncollected Fiction. I understand they're all as they were written, except for maybe two or three, got slight slight modifications? Well, they were written when I was starting out. And, uh, you know, a, a professor at the University of Minnesota dug these up. His name is Peter Reed, and he's since become a personal friend. But I never saved any of my early stuff. I never thought I would amount to a hill of beans, and perhaps I haven't. But anyway, uh, he did the archaeology, and uh, when I saw these stories that I wrote when I was starting out, and they were all sold. They were sold to magazines. Uh, I wanted, I said, gee, I, I could do even better, you know. <laughs> it was a temptation to uh, make myself a better writer than I was back then. But uh, actually, the, uh, I'm told the stories hold up. Uh, so, hooray. Well, I need not tell you folks, we have one of the most prolific writers ever. The list is incredible. Slaughterhouse Five, Time Quake, God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, Cat's Cradle, Breakfast of Champions, of course, coming out as a movie now. Happy birthday, Wanda June. And I understand you've got yourself a little part in the movie version of Breakfast of Champions. Correct? Yes. Well, this is the third movie I've been in. I'm, yes. a, I'm a member of, of SAG, for heaven's sake. <laughs> yes, you are. You were you were in Mother Night in 1996. And then I was in Slaughterhouse Five, and I was cut. But even if you are cut, you still get a movie credit. I still get residuals for my acting part in uh, <laughs> Slaughterhouse Five, although I was the face on the cutting room floor. Well, of course, I personally, I think the funniest thing you ever did in film was a, a film with Rodney Dangerfield back in '86 called Back to School, where you played yourself. And it it is the standard paradox that takes place in colleges all over the nations, a situation whereby a student reads a book, and he turns it into his professor, his analysis of the book, and the professor says, no, what Mr. So-and-so was saying here was so-and-so. Well, of course, the funny thing in this movie was they had Rodney Dangerfield was a rich fella, so he had you writing his son's actual reports for him, and then the professor gets up and says, no, Mr. Mr. Vonnegut did not mean this, and of course you were the one who had written it. It was so funny because it was. Yeah. I, it, it it takes place in every college. It goes well, on every day. I, I think the movie <laughs> went a long way toward making me famous in my neighborhood. Anyway, as okay. it, my dry cleaner treated me with a lot more respect. Oh, he did. <laughs> uh, but uh, the yeah, it, it, he hired me to write a, a paper on myself. Right. And the teacher said two things to him. She said one. You did not write this. Two, whoever did write it doesn't know the first thing about Vonnegut. In the first <laughs> <laughs> Vonnegut had written the term paper, but uh, I, the, the French benefit of that part, uh, besides becoming making me famous, was that I got to know Dangerfield, who uh, endless, absolutely first-rate jokes, none of which I'd ever heard before. <laughs> okay. Joining us today on a special edition, uh, 11 a.m. here in Los Angeles, is Kurt uh, Vonnegut on Stein Online with Elliot Stein. Let's uh, let's go back to the beginnings and find out when the since you gave us uh, a introduction whereby you didn't even know that your short stories you think you didn't even know if anything would come of them. Let's go back to when the writing bug hit you. Was it as a schoolboy? Was it as something you like to do? Well, I I went to an overachievers high school in Indianapolis called Shoreditch High School. And what Indianapolis was about three quarters of a million people, and and uh, towns all over the country of that size used to have an elitist high school, and uh, where the town was obviously spending more per capita than they were in other high schools. But this high school had had a daily paper. Can you imagine a high school with a daily paper uh, since 1906? So a heck of a lot of writers came out of there, including uh, 
head writer on the I Love Lucy show. Uh, but and Dan Wakefield. Uh, but anyway, uh, we had, you couldn't make the football team if if you didn't have a bald spot by the time you were 11. And uh, so a whole lot of us uh, spent our afternoons instead getting out a daily paper. And so, yeah, I got to write a lot. Did you ever see anything like the Internet popping up, Kurt, at all? Did you ever have, a vision, uh, have uh, any kind of thoughts? Well, I, I, I saw a very early version of it. Mm -hmm. uh what I'm an old guy, you know. I'll be 77. Yeah, and, I know. And uh, so, uh, yeah. But I remember in Indianapolis, uh, ham radio operators who would, you know, they they usually had rather poor complexions and uh, not many friends in Indianapolis and spent most of their time in the attic or the basement, wherever the radio set was. Uh, but uh, these people would say, you know, I got a friend in Nome, Alaska. Or I got a friend in Tampa, and his wife just had twins, and and so there there was this reaching out then, and uh, uh and uh, so yes, yeah, something like that. Uh, but it was enough to simply to talk to somebody far away. That was uh, miracle enough. Uh, no, but of course, nothing as rich as the internet was possible or or even imaginable then. I think. Most people that are familiar with your background know that you were in World War II. You were there for the bombing of Dresden. Of course, this became part of what many people feel is your ultimate work, Slaughterhouse Five. Did you feel that the motion? P did you see the motion picture for Saving Private Ryan? No, I didn't. Okay. I, as I, I didn't want to watch it. Oh. I, mean, I, I didn't want to see stuff like that. I sort of chicken. I see. Well. Since you've told us this, was Slaughterhouse Five a way of personally dealing with what you saw as a soldier in inventing emotion, uh, trying to deal with the humane aspects of it? What? How does your having actually been there and being in numerous historical places? Well, I, I when I was growing up and and going to this overachievers high school with a daily paper. I uh, never wanted to be anything or expected to be anything but a journalist. Mm -hmm. And uh, the scale of the Dresden firebombing, which, you know, which I had survived, uh, didn't become a matter, matter of public record until, I don't know, 10, 15 years after the war. And uh, it turned out that that firebombing was the largest massacre in European history, and I hasten, hasten to say, you know, is Auschwitz killed a hell of a lot more people. Is it slowly? Is as a massacre? Is killing a whole lot of people all at once? And apparently, the record holder was Dresden. And and journal the, the journalist in me uh, said, gee, you know, since you were there, is shouldn't you say something about it? And uh, so yes, I did. Uh, and also. I wanted to make a living. People hate to hear that about artists, you know, <laughs> that they will do things in the hope of, of getting paid. Uh, but it did make my reputation as, as a serious as a serious writer, and, and so uh, critics began to pay attention to my work. As before that, uh, I'd been, you know, a, a negligible science fiction writer, and, and uh, so was not likely to get an important review in the New York Times, for example. Some people say that trying to read Slaughterhouse Five was difficult; that they they couldn't keep track of the person and jumping through different ports uh, portals in time. Uh, do you? Do you feel that this is a justified criticism? I had just heard it enough throughout my life. People, I, I've, there's two camps I've heard here, Kurt, with that book. I've heard people say, "Oh, I, you know, this is fantastic." And I hear people go, "That was, I, I don't know, is the most confusing thing. I don't understand what happened and how he wound up there and what the relationship was." I've heard both. Yeah, well, it, it all depends on on how good a reader the the person is. It's it's ordinarily taught, I think, in a junior or senior year in high school. And some people are uh, more skilled readers 
than others. Uh, and to think that literacy is an easy business uh, is not at all. Uh, uh, it's as tough, really, as, as learning to play the French horn. Is what you do is look at little symbols, arrangements of 26 phonetic symbols and 10 numbers on uh, sheets of... Uh, bleached and flattened wood pulp and out of this you are supposed to be able to simply looking at these arrangements of symbols to uh, recreate the Battle of Gettysburg if necessary or a great love affair and, and these are very minimal cues and actually most people uh, aren't awfully good at doing that and so the, uh, you know a, a junior in high school for instance working hard, learning to read and write and and, uh, all that, but not very good at it. Uh, If a novel bounces around in time from the future to the past and to the present, uh, as Slaughterhouse-Five does, uh, a person who really can't read awfully well will say, hey, give me me a break, you know, (laughs) this is hard enough without having to jump around in time. but uh, ink on paper stories are, are an elite to start form and have never had a, a huge audience because reading is hard to do. What are your thoughts on the translation to a motion picture? Do you feel that they did uh, a job that you feel was worthy, or do you think that it was a Hollywood version of your novel? What have been your thoughts? Well, is I, I have said often, and I'll say again, that there are two novelists who ought to be very grateful to Hollywood, mm-hmm. as I'm one of them, for right. Slaughterhouse-Five. And the other one is Margaret Mitchell, of course, who <laughs> gone with the wind. Right. Uh, but, no, I was utterly wild and pleased. But about <clears throat> making movies, they, they are a separate work of art. And um, from a book, and I'm fortunate enough to be completely in print now, now that my earliest stories have been published. And so the stories, people can see what it is I did. And uh, uh, the movie of Slaughterhouse-Five was a superb work of art by a man named Stephen Geller, who's now a professor of film at the University of uh, Boston College. But he's a close personal friend. He did me a terrific favor by making such a swell movie. But again, a movie is a separate work of art. And for a novelist to try to do a screenplay of his own work is uh, like a lawyer trying to practice medicine. There's a, a very different sets of mind and skills. Of course, if they did the if they did the movie these days, Kurt, they would have some kind of musical hard rock musical soundtrack associated with it and they'd be showing videos on MTV of the bombing of Dresden and, and intercutting it and splicing it with some rock group playing. I mean, that's what they do these days. Well, yes, as they want that 14-year-old audience. <laughs> I did. So I'm glad they made it when when they did. Well, do you, do you remember what the soundtrack was? No, I, I, I remember the movie very well, All but, right, well, but tr- I don't. Try this. It was one of the... It was... Glenn Gould, who was one of the greatest living pianists at mm-hmm. that time, okay. improvising on Bach. That's not a bad soundtrack. Either. No, not at all. You're, you're you're in good company. You know, I'm I, right now. We're we're pulling up here in the office. We're pulling up uh, some information about the the movie, and I see there's a comment there that was put in by a somebody, and and this this summarizes it exactly what we've been talking about. Somebody says here. It says, to anyone who liked the book of Slaughterhouse-Five or was just plain confused by it, and there that is again, it says, I've had to re- I have to recommend this marvelous movie adaptation of Vonnegut's work. I see that that's up on one of the, the big movie databases up on uh, the Internet, and so I guess a lot of people feel the same, <laughs> again, feel the same way about the book, that either they understood it or they were a bit confused. But, uh, yes, uh, it was a great translation. We're talking to Kurt Vonnegut. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to start going to questions that lots of questions that I were sent in advance that people want me to ask. So let us do that. The first question for you says, Mr. Vonnegut, 
do you feel you write better when you are distressed or when you are comfortable? And then it says, please note, I'm using the word distressed rather than the garbage word stressed. Stress is a helpful concept, while distress is not necessarily so. Well, is is there another word with a lot of S's in it, which is depressed? Okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, I taught at the Writers' Workshop at the University of Iowa in 65 and 66. Of course, that program has been going since 1932, and the teachers have been professional writers, you know, down on their luck or whatever, but people who've been published and have had a lot of experience uh, writing. In the medical school there, the woman at the medical school said, hey, we've got a pretty interesting sample of real writers. Uh, maybe we can find out in, uh, in what ways they're crazy or whatever. And so she started interviewing them. Uh, she interviewed me. Nelson Algren was on the faculty at the same time. She interviewed him. Vance Bourgeli is Jose Denoso, a great Chilean novelist who's dead now. Uh, but she did this for many years, and not knowing what she was going to find out, uh, whether we hallucinated or more than other people or whatever. And she asked us, you know, hey, have you ever gone nuts? Or uh, in what way did you go nuts? And did you have relatives who went nuts? Uh, I mean, I'm simplifying her questions, of course. But she was startled to find that we were uh, very commonly, I mean, the majority of us, were monopolar depressives, not mm -hmm. getting the high, uh, from families of monopolar depressives. So yes, is uh, if I've written well, it's because I'm depressed most of the time, and uh, that's certainly stressful. <laughs> okay, well then, people who are depressed have really something very good to look forward to in the future. I, I mean, it's the first time I've <laughs> I've heard something really. Uh, related to depression that has a very positive side to it. You, you might well, be a very creative writer then. Well, it, and uh, well, as a um, psychiatrist who's been dead for a while now, Edmund Burglar uh, published a swell book which I'm trying to get brought back into print. It's called The Writer and Psychoanalysis. And uh, he practiced in New York and claimed to have treated more writers, real writers, than anybody else, and I'm sure it's the case, is I had some friends who were blocked who went to him, and that was his specialty. But he was able to generalize about writers, and he said we were very fortunate uh, in being able to treat our neuroses every day. The act of writing uh, was a pretty good medicine uh, for the treatment of depression. He said, too, that when a uh, writer was blocked. He suddenly couldn't treat himself or herself anymore. Uh, in terrible trouble. Is is in danger of going nuts. Okay. Let's go to more questions that we have been given in advance, and then we'll go to even some live online. Somebody says here, and I'll read it to you the way it is, and it's obvious what they're what they're asking. It's they first they put in quote, Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck in time. And then they add a line that says, and pops up in Belgrade, mid-1999. And then it says, I would love to get a two-minute riff from you on this scenario. Obviously, the man's, I mean, here we are talking about inhumanity, war, going on in the mid-40s. And this man is saying, who's sending you this letter, and he wants you to comment on it's still going on here. In mid ninety nine, the same kinds of things that you, the same kinds of things you saw, Kurt, are going on to this year. Yes, and uh, I don't think we need any more proof that we are really awful animals. And <laughs> I think that uh, when young people realize uh, what cruel animals we are, uh, I, I, well, in, in my book. Timequake, my last novel, yeah. uh, I say that one of the big secrets is uh, that, that we think so ill of the human race. Just, you know, the evidence is obvious that we're awful animals. Uh, a lot of people uh, would just assume that it ended. They don't say so, but it would be no great tragedy if the uh, human race were wiped off the face of the earth. And I, I wrote a... Uh, I wrote a piece for Playboy, uh, which was published 
January 1999, about the year 2000, and I was talking about, uh, you know, how the antibiotics aren't working anymore, and and uh, a really elaborate, uh, a, a re- an incurable disease it appeared, uh, AIDS, and uh, so I came to the conclusion that the planet's immune system is trying to get rid of us. <laughs> we are really an awful infection. <laughs> Well, I've never never quite heard anybody put it that way before <laughs> in regards to uh, that uh, the bacteria problem we're having with the superbugs that are resistant. And uh, it's suddenly something to ponder here. Um, and that's probably why, uh, you, as we have seen, we, we belong in cages, as you have. Well, we ourselves are a disease, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. What we've done to the water and the atmosphere and the topsoil and, and the other animals and so forth. And so, uh, you know, there's a planet that's defending itself as best he can and f- against this terrible sickness called humanity. Let's go to more questions. People talk. There's people right now talking about you every day all over the world. Well, what I've written, I was born to write, and if it had been unpopular, I still would have mm-hmm. written it. And I have survivor syndrome now and again I'm almost 77 not because of the second world war although I had a lot of friends killed during that uh, I have survivor syndrome this embarrassment about still being alive uh, because I know so many perfectly wonderful writers who were never able to make a living and uh, it is you, know, you talk about the free enterprise and the free market the Adam Smith market and all that is artists are the only people in America who really uh, operate that way, is uh, putting out a product and uh, uh, surviving or, or failing. But uh, I've known so many absolutely first-rate writers. The one that really comes to mind is Richard Yates, who wasn't able to make a living. And, and Christ, I think he was twice the writer I am. Well, it's very humble, and uh, I'm sure... That is something he would uh, would very well respect and cherish, those words that you've given us. Let's go to another question that we have received in our advanced mailbag here. The next question is, um, Mr. Vonnegut, which do you think would be more interesting, heaven or hell? Well, it, it's, it, of course, writers have, have dealt with that again and again and again, and even Mark Twain. And uh, so... Uh, you know, it's tempting to a writer to write about it, but almost always they finally decide they'd rather be in hell. Uh, I, I forget who wrote the story where uh, a man dies, and, uh, you know, it, it's the weather is where he goes to. The weather is awfully nice, and, and there's sweet music, and, and uh, it's extremely peaceful, and... and uh, he finally says, you know, I think I'd rather be in hell. And St. Peter says to him, where do you think you are? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I, I'm a humanist, of course, which means that uh, we don't necessarily uh, believe in an afterlife and, and behave behave well, uh, try to, uh, without any expectation of reward or punishment in an afterlife. And I am honorary president of the American Indian. Humanist Association is essentially, you know, agnostics, and uh, I succeeded a much better science fiction writer, Isaac Asimov, as honorary president. I spoke at a memorial service for Isaac to a group of humanists, and again, these are people who uh, don't think a lot about an afterlife, and at one point at this memorial service, is, I said, Isaac is up in heaven now. And it brought down the house. It was the funniest thing I could have said to an audience <laughs> of humanists. And I rolled him in the aisles, and it was several minutes before order could be restored. <laughs> well, that sounds like a lot of fun. And it's interesting, you uh, what you said about um, hell and heaven there. And, of course, Rod Serling 
uh, dealt with that concept. Who is a up lot. in heaven, incidentally? Yes, uh, I've heard as much. He dealt with that concept a lot, showing that one man's heaven is another man's hell, and vice versa. Yeah. In a number of his episodes, and uh, certainly it is. Um, it's always been something to contemplate. We are talking to the legendary Kurt Vonnegut. We have about 25 minutes left. We're taking questions live. We're taking some that were sent to us online, a whole combination. So let us go to one or two posted live online. The first one is for you, uh, Kurt. It says the technology, The f no, it says the fear of technology in player piano has seemed to become a re reality with this Y2K mumbo-jumbo. What is your take on where technology is leading us? Well, the technologies that really disturb me are, are uh, the ones used in war is, is weaponry. And uh, I, I guess it was Sartre, maybe somebody in your audience can correct me. I think it was either Sartre or Camus uh, who said because of new technologies, we no longer make history. Uh, history shapes us, and uh, certainly the technology, including the one we're using today, uh, are reshaping us. Um, and uh, the most prescient novel of all time, the most influential novel of all time, uh, was written and was published by a woman only 19 years old. As many in your audience will know who this was. It was more than 100 years ago. It was 1818, and the book, of course, was uh, Frankenstein, or the New Prometheus, by Mary Shelley, the, who became the wife of uh, the poet Percy Bysshe Shelley. And, uh, of course, Frankenstein, her novel, isn't about one monster, but two the other one being an utterly amoral scientist, uh, indifferent to the consequences of, of what he adds to the culture. And uh, so, yeah, as I, I hate nuclear weapons, for instance, and, uh, uh, well, I, I hate tanks and flamethrowers, too. Uh, but anyway, it's the war, war technologies that distress me more than anything else, and it's interesting that... Mary Shelley, 19 years old, in 1818, 100 years before the end of the First World War, uh, foresaw uh, how technology was really going to uh, push us around. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's mostly weaponry that uh, distresses me. Well, that is amazing, and of course, your observation about Mary Shelley that at 19 years old, because these days, this is a lot of 19 year old. Women are mostly into music videos and going disco dancing, and I'm not here to I'm not here putting down young women. I'm just saying that just at least what you see out there, uh, it seems that seems to be the thing they're they're <laughs> most concerned about. And uh, here was this woman who was very concerned back then about humanity and where it's going. And but she was she was so lucky. She had perfectly wonderful parents. Mm -hmm. Is her, yes. her father uh, was a preacher who also wrote. He was an anti-Calvinist preacher, which is the only kind to be, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, her mother was an early feminist, and her mother wrote books which were illustrated by William Blake. Try that. <laughs> How would you like to have your books illustrated by William yeah. Blake? <laughs> but friends of the family, as people hanging around the house when she was growing up, included Tom Paine, William Blake... William Wordsworth, and so she got a much better boost <laughs> into uh, vivid thinking, uh, humane thinking, uh, than most young people, or anybody in history, probably. Do you have any favorites among the new breed of writers? Do you have any comments, criticism, thoughts in general about when you go to a bookstore and look at fiction or books that are sent to you and you're able to make comparisons? Well, it, uh, the practice of literature is not like the practice of medicine, uh, so you don't have to keep up with the latest thing. Is uh, Most contemporary novels are ones written you know, in the last few years, uh, 
have been half of the deal is is almost a movie treatment if the book also doesn't become a movie it's a failure as i was born in 1922 and my generation of writers which would be gore vidal is truman capote norman mailer erwin shaw and so forth we wrote book books which simply were to be complete under themselves as books and uh aimed at readers rather than a movie audiences. I don't fault contemporary young writers now for having movies in mind, as I would too if I had been their age. And, and uh, uh, But I also feel that no more books need to be written, and uh, that there are so many wonderful books in the library already. And what am I reading now? Well, on this trip, as I'm out hustling my latest collection, which is the Gombo snuff box. Uh, I'm reading uh, Boswell's Life of Johnson, Samuel Johnson. Yeah, you know, and I, I read that on a plane, just open it anywhere and start reading it. I'm also reading Thomas Wolfe's last book, uh, which put together posthumously out of you know tons of paper. It's called The uh, Hills Beyond, and I'm. Uh, also recently read uh, a masterpiece I'd pretended to have read and, uh, even when talking to its author which I hadn't read which was the rector of Just Justin by Louis Auchincloss but all these books are for people who are extremely good readers uh, you have to be you know is, is a, but my art is the only one which requires members of the audience to be performers because uh, reading is about as easy as playing the French horn uh, but anyway and uh, what one book that knocked my block off because of who I am and, and how deeply interested I am in literature is a book I commend to the attention of your most literate uh, uh, your most literate the most literate members of your audience is a book called Reader's Block, not Writer's Block, but mm -hmm. Reader's Block by David Markson, uh, which I find is in bookstores as I travel around, but really is people who are into literature are really good readers should read uh, Reader's Block. But, you know, it's just no, it will never be a movie. It's a book. I want to remind you all, of course, pick up some early Kurt Vonnegut uh, short stories in this new collection, which is called Bagambo Snuffbox, Uncollected Fiction, 23 short stories that he wrote for various prominent national magazines from 1954 through 1961. Let's go back uh, to the uh, mailbag and get some questions that came in in advance. We'll try to mix them up with ones online now and ones we got in advance. It says, do you feel racism, sexism, classism, and the myriad other pervasive societal scabs will clear up, or are you optimistic that our culture will develop some kind of topical cream to cure history's injustices? Then it says, in other words, your sense of satire borders on genius, but how much of it is cynicism? Okay, tackle that one, Kurt. <laughs> well, I, I, about cynicism is... is uh I think we're vile animals, and, and, and <laughs> as I've said, as I think that maybe the planet's immune system should get rid of us. Uh, uh, but I also see saints, which uh, just anywhere, and my idea of a saint is a person who behaves decently in the middle of an indecent society, and uh, you're likely to come across them almost anywhere. And... Uh, that encourages me, keeps me going, that the, there are these people who behave decently, damn well going to behave decently no matter what. Uh, so that's encouraging to me, is that keeps me going. But uh, in general, I think we're terrible animals. It's certainly two world wars. And, uh, well, try this. As here we are, the beacon of liberty of the world. We had human slavery very recently. You take... Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway were both born, I don't know, about 1893, somewhere around there, 1895. They were much closer 
to the inconceivable atrocity of human slavery than we are to the Holocaust today. So uh, do you, you don't think we have any possibility of uh, finally dealing with these problems? Yes, we are dealing with them as, as they were only identified as uh, uh, ugly uh, racism, identified as a sickness as an illness in a society uh, very recently. My goodness. Uh, you know, you talk about technological pro- uh, progress is... Uh, the fact that uh, racism is denounced now and uh, that women are finally equal to men uh, in the, under law and so forth. This is all in my lifetime. And, uh, okay, is, is, uh, if we also got the hydrogen bomb in that same period of time, uh, almost a pretty decent trade-off. But no, only there's been justice Justice is a very new idea, and uh, uh, we're trying to make it a reality. Uh, I'd say only since the time I was well, from say from nineteen thirty-five on, is there was interest in in bringing an end to racism as much to the extent we could. so no it, it that is that is so astonishing uh that, it, that justice uh is has finally become an enthusiasm okay we got lots uh, more questions online and in advance for our special guest Kurt Vonnegut the newest book Bagambo Snuffbox Uncollected Fiction Short Stories Early Ones published in magazines you'll find it in bookstores nationwide and at www.amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com uh, people want to know about the uh, rumors here about a new novel you have coming up here uh, it's a joke oh it is yes it's not real no oh okay <laughs> no it's a, really my, I, I, you know what the hell give me a break because I'm, I'm 77 uh, years old <laughs> I've been allowed to say everything, and and you know now I'm completely in print, even my earliest stories now. Right. So I'm, even when I'm dead, I'll be talking my head off. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, apparently you fooled a lot of people. I mean, they were going, God, we want to find out about this new novel. <laughs> um, somebody would like thinks that player piano would make a tremendous movie. Uh, your thoughts on that? Would it, do you think any of the your other works uh, that have not been turned into motion pictures should have been or should be? Well, they uh, again, I'm enormously pleased with Slaughterhouse Five, mm-hmm. and a perfectly awful movie was made out of uh, oh, Jailbird. Uh, no, not Jailbird. Uh, I still think of it in a minute. I've forgotten the name what, of what, one what, of my what, books. Wanda June, That's Wanda what a great, great literary yeah. scholar I am. <laughs> But anyway, uh, no, again, my books are book books and are to stand on their own. And, yes, they they can be turned into movies, but the movie audience is is such that uh, uh, they wouldn't like my kind of stuff, I don't think. Well, it seems that a lot of the movies these days, I, I maybe there was a period, yes. Uh, of course, your other your other movie book was Happy Birthday, Wanda June. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> um, and that was what? That was from uh, the early 70s. Yeah. It was around the same time as uh, Slaughterhouse-Five. These days, these movies coming out, like The Matrix, which I'm sure you've heard about. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Uh, I think that... He, You've got a stylization in those that would work well with some of some of your materials. I mean, ask start asking people about the Matrix because they'll tell you that yes, there's 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 some Vonnegut in there. Absolutely, I think a lot of people will agree with that. So, uh, and, but these are newer ones that came out this year. I yeah, think. well, it, no, it's fine. As I say, all I do is make books, and that's all members of my generation did. Mm-hmm. Is and I have said in print, as far as I'm concerned, the most wonderful movie ever made with my life is a dog. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, it's a good movie, definitely one of your favorites. Do you watch any television at all? Or do you of course, it's a great time killer, and, okay. and uh, there are works of genius on 
uh, you know, I was put, the magazines were put out of business, put out of the short story business by television, so I was put out of business. I was the mm-hmm. same way because I was going to write short stories all my life and make big bucks. Uh, but, yes, there have been, I mean, human beings, what they are, there are Shakespeare's and Mozart's in our midst right now, and I've seen works of genius on television, and I, some things on television have have uh, been as good as plays during the 20s and 30s, during the golden age of, of legitimate theater, supposedly, of Broadway. But I think uh, Homicide can be a profoundly moving show. I think Fraser and uh, uh, Cheers are witty as they can be, just as a consumer. And uh, I've seen very little in contemporary theater that makes me laugh as hard as those two shows or admire the wit of the writers as much as I do. What do you like to do for just relaxation? Do you have any hobbies other than writing? If we just... if we turn off writing or uh, reading? Is there other things you, do you I, have? I a, paint. Okay. And I, I watch girls and daydream. I, okay, well, I do the same, and I'm sure most of the most of our listeners do, at least the males do as well. Um, the paintings, that's something that I think people would like to see. How many paintings have you done? Well, is I really don't know uh, how many paintings I've, I've always painted because uh, my father was an architect and a painter, and so was my grandfather, and and uh, so uh, I was painting in oils or, uh, mm-hmm. for a long time, and then, uh, but in the last ten years, or, I've been making silk screens. Is I paint with opaque materials on acetate. Mm-hmm. And I have to make one acetate for each color, and then a silk screen maker, uh, a genius at it in uh, in Lexington, Kentucky. His name is Joe Petro the Third, P E T R O. Uh, he prints them, and uh, this is a particularly rewarding art form uh, in that the inks that are used by uh, in silk screens are essentially paints. And so the colors are brilliant, more brilliant than other sorts of of, uh, of prints. And uh, so, yeah, I've been doing that and watching girls. <laughs> uh, so if I wanted to get a print of a Kurt Vonnegut painting, I, I would be able to do so then? You get in touch with Joe Petro Three of Lexington, Kentucky. Oh, okay. Well, that's certainly something I... Well, no, they're limited. Well, I, I didn't mean to hustle either. I'm here to hustle a book. But I know anyway, that. I know. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, is the editions uh, uh, are about thirty, and they're numbered. You know, as one slash thirty, two set slash thirty, and then uh, we destroy the acetate, so there never be any more. Just a few more minutes left here with Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, Kurt, uh, certainly an appropriate question for you is. Your thoughts about some of the violence, especially involving young people going into schools or the, some of the just uh, outlandish, violent things that we have seen in the news, what, what has happened? I mean, we didn't see these things in the 1950s. Uh, maybe well, we, we're keeping track of them more. Mm-hmm. Is we, you know, uh, there may have been a hell of a lot of shootings in schools that... Uh, uh, we didn't hear about it. Don't remember now. Is I I don't know what the statistics are. It's certainly, they they uh, shootings in schools are uh, lead offs for the news. You know, it's, it's all very exciting. But I we have this obvious public health problem. Is you know, is HIV is a threat to us. But another organism which is very bad for us, obviously, is a firearm. And uh, my father was a gun nut, and I was raised to be a gun nut, and uh, you know, and had a gun in the war and knew all about it. And uh, but uh, no, I want these things eliminated from our midst. Is uh, it's just too easy for anybody to get revenge. I mean, they're as easy to operate as cigarette lighters. Yeah, you don't need any instructions with them, of no, course. No, and, and, and uh, you'd be surprised how fast women learn to work them. 
But anyway, no, these are the public health problem which should be eliminated, and and of course, if, uh, the, if, if the NRA will read the whole Second Amendment, it's the idea was to provide a militia when we needed it, and uh, in the beginning, as this country depended on militias, you know, guys who would go march and, and I guess have a rifle practice and stuff down on the village green or whatever and in time of war they'd be called up and uh, of course many of the units in the, for the Union in the Civil War uh, were militias who were called up came with their own officers, their own weapons came with all of it And uh, but the last time we used called up militias was in the Spanish American War and these were such poor soldiers so pu- poorly disciplined and uh, uh, really not very good at, at living out in the out of doors for a long time uh, that we gave up on militias and, and uh, that's when we formed the National Guard you know and these people really drill and, and are disciplined and, and learn how to be soldiers uh, so we no longer have militias Okay, we got time just for one more question, and I think it is one that certainly um, someone like yourself should answer for us, and it talks about book bannings. Uh, book bannings are still going on in school districts to this day. You could go, you can get a list of the school district, here are the books they've banned. Your thoughts about that? Well, of course, what they're doing now in Kansas is banning Charles Darwin. <laughs> uh, no, it's it's people feel that they have a right to to uh, say how their children should be raised uh, and uh, they want their children protected from some ideas and encouraged to hold others and uh, we in fact have the First Amendment which uh, calls for separation of, of church and state and, and uh, also freedom of speech and this is painful to a lot of parents, but they uh, have to learn to live with that. I've said that the First Amendment is a tragic amendment, and there are many things that are said and taught which upset me greatly. Uh, but uh, it never occurred to me to muzzle anyone. Uh, but the to ban a book, as Slaughterhouse Five has been banned, it was actually in Drake, North Dakota. Uh, school committee had the janitor throw whatever copies they had of Slaughterhouse Five into a furnace and uh, that's against the law like parking by a fire plug is you must not do that in the United States of America and those people in Drake as a member of the school committee uh, were in fact sued by the teacher that they had fired for teaching the book and uh, because this is America well, this has been quite a show here today. We got a chance to find out what Kurt Vonnegut's thinking about. We've covered a lot of things today. Certainly want to remind you all to pick up his new book, which is a collection of short stories, Bagambo Snuffbox, Uncollected Fiction. 23 short stories he wrote from 1954 to 1961 for various national magazines. You can find that, of course, in bookstores nationwide and at www.amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com. Well, this has been great, Kurt. Um, so May I ask you a question? Sure. I are love you, people ask me questions. <laughs> are you a writer? Well, I'm not a writer of, of fiction, but a lot of time I write, sometimes I write satire. I write comedy, humor, a lot of parody and satire on things, and I usually keep it to myself. I usually don't print it. Sometimes I let it out, uh, sometimes... But that's that's my thing is satire and parodies on uh, existing things. That's that's what I do. All right. Well, the practice <laughs> of any art, Elliot, is to make the soul grow, and you're doing that for yourself. So cheers. <laughs> oh, 